Hello and good day to you. How are you? Welcome to our live. Jumping into the Word of God. Excited about it. Uplifted about it. Every morning we jump into the Word of God. Having a great time in the Word. How are you? Good morning, good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the live. Hope you're doing great. Sorry, I missed you yesterday. I missed all of you yesterday. I know, I know. I was... Uh, traveling and uh, I thought I was going to have uh, the time uh, to actually do it but uh, unfortunately with uh, everything that was happening I was unable to do it and uh, my apologies for that uh, but I'm excited to be back with you uh, this morning and we're going to jump on into where we left off 2 Corinthians we finished up chapter 3, and now we're going to be moving on to chapter 4. How you doing, Carol? How you doing, Miranda? It's good to see all of you again. Jennifer, how are you? Great to see all of you. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the live. We're going to have a blast. Uh, sorry I missed you. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? Linda, Stephanie, good to see you. Swine Lord, it's always good to see you. How goes the story time? It's awesome, Swine Lord. You know it. It's awesome. We're here. You're here. What more could I ask for, Swine Lord? <laughs> it's great. I'm so sorry, everyone, that um, yesterday I was unable to uh, uh, make the morning uh, time. I thought it was. Queen, how you doing? <laughs> Uh, come on, come on. I'm sorry, Miranda. I'm sorry. Uh, Brother James, what's happening? The Thinker. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, so, uh, yes, chapter four, we're going to be jumping on into the Word of God. I want to let you know this will be, it is also being broadcast live right now on YouTube. We've got it live on YouTube. How you doing? Uh, my YouTube channel is at Chip Mitchell 23. That where that's where you can get all of our previous studies. They're all there. Um, please go there, subscribe, check it out. Um, if you can't get through uh, this one this morning, uh, I've got it on the YouTube. Also, you can go to my webpage, which is groundedinhispromises.com. Please go there. Um, if you there's a host of resources that I put out there. That way. You can uh, just encourage your faith. There's some apologetic things out there on faith, the existence of God, just some great things uh, to go there. There's also a host of questions called Honest Answers, where um, theologians answer some tough questions that are out there. Who are the Nephilims? You know, um, they, they do a great job of giving you a broad perspective on these things. So please go check it out. Enjoy. Uh, the free information that's out there. Uh, today, we're going to be working on 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. We did uh, uh, chapter 3 two days ago. Uh, awesome, awesome study. Uh, oh, that's awesome. Thanks, Miranda. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, good morning, Meg. How you doing? Uh, well, let's have a prayer, and then we're going to go ahead and jump on in uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Father, thank you for another day. Thank you for life. Thank you for all the many blessings that we have in Christ. We're so honored uh, to be called your children. Help us as we attempt to follow your son, as we attempt to make that decision and be in that decision of being a disciple of, of Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, in our faith. For those of us that are on a journey of faith, trying to find faith, open wide our hearts and our minds as we jump into your word. Uh, and lay, enable us, Father, as we see things that we did not know, 
uh, that challenge our character and our heart to be humble before your word. And Father, we thank you for providing for us uh, your word of God. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, just a, a very powerful uh, uh, section here. Uh, sea Breeze, always lightening up when you come in, Sea Breeze. I love it, I love it, I love it. Uh, very powerful chapter here. The New Covenant ministry is glorious, as we see in uh, this text, um, because there is certain triumphs that we see in Christ. Remember it's, uh, chapter 2, he talks about the triumphs in Christ and the transformative work of the Holy Spirit. We see that in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 18. It says, and we all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Wow. Love that verse. The Lord who is the spirit, transformative power. So we see the transformative work of the spirit. But it is not without hardship. We also see the physical demands that Paul's ministry sometimes seems to be, in many cases, too much even for him to bear. Uh, we see that in the text. No less the excruciating, excruciating challenges of the spiritual demands that are on us. We see all of that. Um, this is brought on all who serve the Lord. These challenges come. They're both physical and they're spiritual. Um, and we also see the challenges of those that oppose the gospel message. We see all that. And then when we get here in uh, chapter 4, he's really uh, pulling all this together under the new covenant. The, the, this I've, this, I've, uh, this diakonos, uh, di you know, what is this? This ministry, right? This service, this, this service that we have in God. And, and, he, and he really does a great job here in chapter 4 talking about that. So let's start in chapter 4 verse 1. It says, therefore since through God's mercy we have this ministry. This ministry. That's what we have. Through God's mercy we have this ministry. Now mind you, the transformative nature of the of the spirit, the, the, the physical demands of it. But we have this ministry by the mercy of God. This is a gift of God. And because it is from God and from his mercy, notice what he says, we do not lose heart. There are many challenges that you will face as a follower of Jesus that are challenging on all levels. But notice what he says, because of God's grace and mercy, because of his mercy, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways we do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. Listen to what he says. He says, because of this, well, well, what's coming against us? What are the pending challenges? Well, we renounce secret and shameful ways. The, the, what, what combats against being faithful to this calling are the secret and shameful ways of the world. The, the, the sinful behaviors that are still out there, even though we're being transformed, they fight for our attention. They fight for our thinking. They fight for our desires so that we live in a way that is contrary to the ministry we've been called to. And, and what does he say? Well, when you look to what God has done, when you look to the grace and mercy that comes from God, it allows us to renounce those secret and shameful ways. And notice what he says after that. We do not use deception nor distort the word of God. Well, what's a common challenge? Well, the common challenge is to be deceived, to deceive ourselves, deceive our own thinking, to deceive those that are around us by doing what? Distorting the word of God, taking what God intended in his message and twisting it to mean something else. But what does that mean? False teaching. You know, I, I still remember the first time someone approached me about the Bible. And they were, were challenging my, my lifestyle that was one that was contrary to what was written in the scriptures. And I remember fighting them with what I thought was 
God's word by saying, look, God loves everybody. You don't know what you're talking about. Stop being judgmental. You know, I would use phrases that are found in the scriptures to justify my life of living a shameful and secret life. Distorting what? How did I do that? By distorting the word of God, by using certain uh, um, scriptures uh, out of context to justify a behavior that is contrary to what God had called me to live. And, and that's so easy to do when we don't want to deal with the word of God as it applies to our life. And, and this is what Paul is saying. He says, what do we do? We, we, we renounce secret and shameful ways. We don't use deception, nor do we distort the word of God for our benefit. Watch this. On the contrary, contrary to that, what do we do? By setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. But what is he saying? He's saying, look, no, we set forth the truth plainly. We commend ourselves to everyone's conscience. We make an appeal to everyone's conscience so that they may know the truth. And, and, and this is, we, we have to allow ourselves to be moldable, pliable by the word of God. And, and, and I love this, on the contrary, setting forth the truth plainly. The truth is, is there. The truth is out there. Do not renounce, deny, or try to wash over the truth, which is plain. It's not complicated. I love what he writes here. Verse 3, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Listen to what he says in verse 3, that yes, there is a contingency of individuals who um, uh, can't see the truth in the gospel. They have a, a very challenging time understanding what the truth is or even accepting the truth. And he says these are individuals, as he says, even if our gospel is veiled, making reference to the earlier passages, when Moses came out of the presence of God, he had to cover his face because they could not see the light of God. And so what is he saying? It is veiled to those who are perishing. Understand that those that can't accept the gospel message, there's a veil over their hearts. This, this veil can only be moved between them and God, them and God. But we must speak the word of God truthfully. And then what happens? This veil is then removed from their heart. And, and it's a powerful, powerful uh, moment when, when, when that actually happens because it, it transforms their understanding of God's word. And, and I think a lot of times what happens is sometimes we can feel um, uh, that we've got to come up with something greater than the word of God to convince someone to believe in God, that somehow we've got to become a, um, a person that is uh, uh, well-versed in philosophy, or we've got to use some type of analogy that will change someone. Well, let me, let me read you a text message. Thanks, Queen. Thank you so much for the roses. So appreciate it. Uh, over the summer, I was asked to come speak to a youth group, a bunch of college students that were on a, a leadership academy where they were being uh, challenged in their leadership to grow to become individuals that could eventually be disciples of God, leaders uh, in God's church, and, and, and it's a broad group. And let me read a letter. I spoke to them about uh, being missionaries, and, 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 and there were some atheists in the group. Now watch, here's a letter I received from a young woman. Listen at what she says. She says, hi, Mr. Mitchell. I do not think, I, did, I don't think you'll remember me, but, and she gave her name. I was on one of the volunteers uh, in the second uh, Hope Youth Corps leadership to Philadelphia this summer. You had spoken to us about evangelism one night, and I came to you after your lesson because I had felt something in me that was moving. I had never felt anything like it before. 
I told you on my journey about claiming atheism for the past two years, straying from God, and even while in my Christian household, and even your response left me in awe as you did not shame me or judge me, but showed me what? Scriptures about some of the disciples who had fallen into doubt. The point of all this is that, sir, God spoke through you in such a miraculous way that night. I know you are an evangelist, and I know you must have and still are doing wonderful things for the glory of God. But I just want to let you know that that lesson changed the rest of my life. Life. I have been waiting for months to send you a message using the number that you said I could use from the certain individual there. At first, I was debating on whether I would spew a bunch of doubts I had accumulated over the years and beg you to give me all of your wisdom on the matters. I even wrote out a list, but in the past month, I realized that the Lord gave me such a grand gift from that weekend, that week. All the loving volunteers and individuals, and she names a few, and you, sir, but uh, the, the whole core wasn't the only gift he gave me. He gave me the ability to know and look at my list of doubts and say, wow, not a single one of these fleeting thoughts truly matters in the face of God's mighty power. And even more so, he gave me the gift of his word so that I can challenge each doubt with the truth of his truth. This is a much long, longer message than I intended it to be. But what I'm trying to say is God showed himself to me through you, Mr. Mitchell. And now I'm going to be baptized again. I'm going to be baptized and born again tomorrow. Whoa, listen at this. This is a young lady in her 20s, a college student, maybe 20, who was an atheist for two years. And, and what she sat in on this message, and I just preached the word. When she told me about her doubt, I showed her the truth of the word of God. That's what I did. And, and you know what? She had all kinds of questions and doubts, and she looked at him. And what did she do? The veil was removed. The veil was removed. How was the veil removed? God removed the veil and she was able to take the word of God and compare them to her doubts and God transformed her heart. Let me tell you something. God is the one that does it. God uses you and I to convey his message. Don't allow yourself to think just because someone is an atheist or doesn't believe in God or has a problem with the Bible that the Bible will not have an effect. This happened well over in the summer, maybe in July. The message I gave that night was the spirit was moving in her heart for months, long after I had an interaction with her, long after I said the things I said to her, long after I even forgot her name. But listen, God was still moving. Don't let folks that are rejecting the truth hinder you from speaking. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. God is going to do what he's going to do with the message. That's what we have to be confident of. Don't try and step out of the, the word of God. People don't want you to speak the word of God. Satan wants you to go to reason. And Satan wants you to use philosophy and human reasoning to persuade people to believe in God. Satan does not want you to use the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is living. It's active. It's powerful. It divides between soul and spirit, joints and matter. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It lays everything bare before the eyes of God. Don't you let their rejection of God prevent you from speaking the word of God. You remain firm on the word of God. I don't care how much they say circular reason. I don't care how much they say it's myth. No, let me tell you something. The word of God is powerful. It is an entity. It is the spirit of God. It is Jesus himself. The word was in the beginning with God and was God and the word became flesh. You keep speaking the word of God with faith and confidence and God will do the rest. God doesn't, God is not depending on you to change anyone. That is between them and God. What God is depending on, on you and I is to speak the word of God. We, to some, it is the aroma of Christ. 
to other. It is the aroma of death. But God says you're going to speak to both. Don't worry about which ones you're speaking to. You just speak. Wow. Powerful, powerful stuff. To those that are perishing. Verse four, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Let me tell you something. Highlight verse four. Highlight verse four. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Why do people reject God's word? Why do people say there is no God? The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Well, if the uh, God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, uh, then w w what it, why, why is that the case? Well, that's the case because Satan has influence over what? Satan has influence over our uh, two things, our thinking and uh, our um, uh, um, the, our desires. Those are the two areas that Satan has uh, great influence over. Our thinking, and the second one is our desires, and that's where he is trying to do. We're in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 4. The God of his age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, and this is why that battle is between them and the demonic forces of evil and God. That, that's what that battle, that battle is not with us. That battle is in the heavenly realms where the demonic forces of evil are fighting against um, God and his intended purposes with them. We just keep presenting God's argument. See, we present the word of God that fights against the word of demonic forces of evil. That's the battle that's facing. When we present our word, it's our word against the demonic forces of evil in their heart and their mind. Our word is not powerful, but when we present God's word, God's word is powerful and it combats uh, powerfully against the demonic forces of evil. That's why you keep putting forth God's word. No matter what they say, we rely on God's word. They say, I reject God's word. That's fine. I'm still going to speak God's word. If they reject God's word, what makes you think they're going to accept my word? Because the battle is against the God of this age that has blinded them. And so this young lady who sends me this message, she had an internal battle that was won by God when she looked to God. She heard the message and she went to God. So they cannot see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ Jesus, who, now notice what it says, who is the image of God. Here we are again. Christ is the image of God, the manifestation of God in the flesh. He is the image of God. That's what he is. We see that here. We see that in uh, Colossians. We see that here in uh, Philippians chapter 2. He is the image of the invisible God. We see that in Hebrews chapter 1. Constantly, constantly, constantly telling us who Jesus is. Put before them Jesus. If you want to know God, put Jesus in front of them. If they want to know the unseen God, they can see the unseen God through whom? The image of Jesus. He is the image of the unseen God. That is what we have. People may not like that. People may not want to hear that, but that is what we have to offer. And they must yield to that. They must yield to that. If you want to know God, get to know the image of God who is found in Jesus. And that's what we continue to put forward. People will say, well, I don't like that. That's circular reason. I don't know what to tell you. But if you want to know God, this is the claim. Therefore, put Jesus before them. Verse 5. For uh, what we preach is not what? Ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as his servant for Jesus' sake. Notice what he's saying here in verse 5. Here it comes again. What do we preach? We do not preach ourselves. See, it's so easy to get caught up in our own worldly wisdom, humanistic reasoning, our own thinking. That's not what we preach. We preach what? Jesus Christ. That's what we preach. We don't preach ourselves. 
We preach Jesus Christ as Lord. You've got to understand that. He is the image of God. He is our Lord. What we put before people is Jesus. This is what we believe. We do not preach ourselves. Verse 6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness. I love this. Let light shine out of darkness. What's he making reference to? Well, Genesis chapter 1, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Wow. <laughs> I mean, Paul is going for it here, right? Uh, he says, made his light shine where? In our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Sorry about that, people. Sorry about that. Um, what is he saying here? Um, light shines out of darkness, talking about Genesis, but the light shines where? In our hearts and gives us the light of the knowledge of God's glory. This is where God wins the battle for the lost. It's in their heart. God does things in his heart that we know nothing about. God is constantly moving in a powerful way to transform the hearts and minds of those that seek him. That's what God is doing. Let light shine out of darkness, made his light to shine in our hearts, to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory displayed in what? The face of Christ. The face of Christ. Wow. You know, he writes this, and, and there are some that actually saw the face of Christ. Paul saw the face of Christ. Now, he was blinded, but there were other occasions where Christ stood by his side. The apostles saw and witnessed the face of Christ. I, I, I can't imagine what these firsthand eyewitnesses that conveyed the message of Jesus Christ to Paul and the others that were not firsthand eyewitnesses. The excitement that must have been in their hearts because they saw the face of Christ. Can you imagine when they closed their eyes? And they imagined and remembered the face of Christ as he spoke the word of truth to them. Can you imagine what they must have contemplated day after day for those firsthand eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus because they remembered how he died. They remembered the blood. They remembered the face. They remembered the beatings. But yet when he rose from the dead, they got the first time they saw his face. And I could only imagine how that affected them as they moved on. And this is why the gospel message grew so powerfully. It was so energetically infused with such enthusiasm because these individuals were firsthand eyewitnesses to the resurrection and that stirred their souls so much that they proclaimed the gospel message. They were not deterred by persecution. They were not deterred by stoning. They were not deterred by death. They gave up everything they had in this life. Why? Because they saw the face of Jesus, the face of Jesus Christ, and they connected it to their heart and their life and who they began. And they would remember his words when he taught. They remembered the miracles he did. They remembered the things he prophesied about, and it transformed them from within. And these pioneers of the faith proclaimed the truth all over the world. Wow, man. Powerful, powerful, powerful message. And Paul is imparting this to the church in Corinth. Verse 7, but we have this treasure, and he calls it a treasure. I love this, in jars of clay, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Listen to what he's saying. He goes, man, when I got connected to this, I understood that this all-surpassing power is from God. It is not from us. God is the one that transforms things. God is the one that changes all things into what they weren't to what they are. It all comes from God. We, verse 8, 
are hard pressed how on every side but not crushed perplexed but not in despair persecuted but not abandoned struck down but not destroyed we always carry around in our body the death of jesus so that the life of jesus may also be revealed where in our bodies wow guys listen to what he's saying because they were uniquely suited to be so close to the resurrected Lord, uniquely suited to being in that first century, to talk to those that were firsthand eyewitnesses to Jesus's life since the days of John the Baptist, all the way to the crucifixion and being able to see his face after the resurrection. What does he say? These things that were displayed to us are all surpassing power from God and not us. These things that we witnessed and saw prove the all-surpassing power of our great God. And notice what he says. And in light of that, we are hard-pressed on every side. But see, because of what we've seen, because of what we've witnessed, because of what we've heard from those that were firsthand eyewitnesses, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. And then I love verse 10. We always carry around in our body what? The death of Jesus Christ. That, 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 the death of Jesus Christ. We carry this around in our body. Why? Because he died and he rose again so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. We were crucified with Christ Jesus and I no longer live, but Christ now lives in me. We were crucified with Christ Jesus, and now I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This is what the Bible says. So I carry around in me what? The life of Jesus, that it may be revealed where? In our body. Whew. Verse 11, for we who are alive are always being given over to death for the sake of whom? Jesus so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Wow, Paul's saying, look, man, we're always under the gun, but even in that, life then is revealed in you. Verse 13, thanks, Bill, for the rose. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. You got to lie. I just love that verse. I believe. Therefore, I have spoken. Uh, what is he doing? He's quoting uh, Psalms 116. I've trusted in the Lord when I said I am greatly afflicted. Uh, he says, I believe, therefore, I have spoken. This is what he's talking about. He's going after it. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe, and therefore, we speak. We have that same spirit of faith. We believe, therefore, we also speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. Well, what is he talking about? The resurrection of the dead. He's saying, look, just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too are going to be raised with him and we will be presented with him. Verse 15, all this is for what? Your benefit. So that, that, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. What's the goal? That this grace, the grace of God, will reach more and more people. We want more and more people to hear it. What am I, why do I do this, this TikTok lot? Just be, because of scriptures like this, that the grace of God may reach more and more people. What do I want you to do? I want you to share this slide. Click the share, share it with as many people as possible. What do I want you to do? I want you to go on the profile page. Click and share any of the things that are inspiring you to friends and family. Click the like on the profile page. Why? I want more and more of this grace to reach more people. That is God's intended purpose. God intends all people to feel and hear this grace and mercy that comes from Christ. I want you to share this. I want this thing to blow up as many people as possible. It's one of many forms where we can get the message out. I want you to share what you're learning in your community with your friends and neighbors. I want you to tell them the nuggets that you're learning of the scriptures. Share with them what God has done in your life. With your coworkers, don't be ashamed to share what God is doing in your life. Don't be ashamed to share the transformative nature of God and his spirit with your friends. 
Don't be afraid of your family. Do it in every form God gives you the availability to share what you've learned about God. Share it. Why? Because the world is combating itself against God. The God of this age does not want the, the truth of who Christ is, the image of God, to be known. And so what is he doing? He's pushing forward an agenda that is anti-God, pushing forward forcefully an agenda. And he will do that in any way, shape, or form he can, by challenging us through persecution, by death, by murder, by lies, distortion of the truth. Any and every means he has available to himself, he wants to combat against what the truth is. Don't allow yourself to be put into a situation of fear uh, for preaching the gospel message. You share what you know to be true, letting people know about the God with whom we serve. Thanks for the fire. They may, yeah, they may laugh. They may mock. But let me tell you something. We share what we know to be true. That's what we're doing. And that's why, hey, if you're on here and you're not following, click the follow. Click the follow. Stop messing around. Click the follow. That way, anytime I go live, you will be known. And you will have a piece of the word of God as we're sharing it. And this will help and encourage you on your journey. Maybe you're looking for faith and have not found faith, but you're trying to figure it out. Maybe you believe in God, but you just can't get your life together. Look, go ahead and follow. Be a part of this group, a part of this community. It's on a journey of faith, being grounded in the promises of God. Be a part of something. You have got to get yourself together in your faith. Get yourself together in your faith. Maybe you're struggling in, in trying to deal with certain sinful behaviors in your life. Or maybe you're struggling with believing that God is with you because you've gone through a mess. Let me tell you something. God is trying to make his appeal to your heart. Be a part of this community. Be here every morning. Hear the word of God and allow God to transform your life. And then you'll find a local community that will help you in your journey of faith. Stop messing around saying, I'm going to get there someday and start getting there today. You have to make some decisions about your faith. This stuff was written for our benefit, for us to learn to follow God as he intended it. That's what God has called us to be. And for those of us who have found faith, share your faith. Do not be cowards in sharing what you know to be true. That doesn't mean to be condescending and to look down on anyone, but share what you know to be true about our God. Be filled with the grace and peace that only comes from Christ and share it with great confidence. Verse 16, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. We are wasting away on the outward side, yet inwardly we are being renewed. How often? Day by day. That's why we're here every day, day by day. Verse 17, I love what he says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. In other words, think about where we're going. Verse 18, so what do we do? We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. What is he saying? The bottom line, what we put our hope in is unseen. Where we're going is unseen. And we don't place our hope in what is seen. And that's what the naysayer wants us to do. That's not how we live. They don't like it. I can't help it. There's nothing I can do about it. We place our hope in the unseen. Since what is seen is what? This is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. Let the, the foolhardy place their hope in what is seen. Because it's temporary. We place our hope, what? In what is unseen. Bada boom, bada bing. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter four. Wow. <laughs> powerful, guys. Powerful, powerful, powerful uh, uh, text, man. Uh, yeah, it is just powerful. In the indigenous, yeah, I, my, one of my good friends, he, he spent uh, a few years over in Papua New Guinea, and and uh, they went into some of the, uh, the, the far-reaching areas of Papua New Guinea, and many people became disciples of Jesus Christ. It, it, the message is the message is the message, and it works in every, in every situation. Uh, I've got friends that have been in the Middle East, and some of the more uh, uh, Islamic countries uh, that 
are, are very strict and conservative and disciples are made there. I've seen them in, in China where Christianity is, is not allowed to have a church there, but yet I've, they've seen them. Um, I'm talking about the countless that killed and burned for refusing to convert. I think those that did that are going to go to the darkest dungeons, the gloomiest dungeons, the Bible says, are reserved for those who lied and killed and burned and used savagery, mask in this idea of Christianity. They were false prophets. They were not Christians. They were liars, deceivers of the word of God, and they used it for their own benefit. And the Bible says the gloomiest, darkest dungeons are reserved for those who did such things. Look at that book. Wow. So that's the real reality. You want to know what God's going to do? He's going to beat the living snot out of those that did such damaging things. God is bringing judgment on them. And the Bible talks about it. Peter says, the gloomiest, dark, darkest dungeons are reserved for those who does, done such terrible things that are ungodly. Jesus says, you make people twice the son of hell that you are. Jesus speaks out again. He calls them vipers. He calls them uh, whitewashed tombs. He calls them dead men's bones. That's what Jesus speaks out against those who manipulated the word of God for their own benefit. God is saying, you know, I'm going, I'm going to beat the living daylights out of them. They are in great judgment. Did God know that's not God's word. That was a lie. That was a forgery. That was not truth. God's truth is not in that. That was a lie. That was all a lie by manipulation of God's word. Terrible on all levels of godliness, on all levels of the Bible's explanation. Wrong in every way. A, a falsehood that has never been portrayed since those days. That's what the Bible, yeah, I, no, I'm missing your point. My point is that those are liars and weren't Christians. I, I would never give any accountability to that being anything of a Christian nature or of God. I think what they spread was lies. It wasn't what the Bible says on how we are even to live. So what they were converting them to was not even any form of biblical Christianity that we see in the scriptures. It was all a lie. It was all a force. It was all twisted and untrue. So there's nothing that I have to say of anything good of those times. It is wrong on every level, every level. And the Bible attests to that. The Bible attests to that. The very thing that they held out to supposedly proclaim, they held out in a lie. They held it out in a lie. And everything that came from that was a lie. It was not true. No different during the Reformation movement where they killed Thousands of individuals that stood up and opposed what they were doing. Thousands were burned at the stake because in the name of so-called Christianity, they were all liars, all false teachers, false prophets of God's word. And judgment is falling upon all of those who participated in that. The lying, deceiving, and that's why the world is in such disarray now with regards to Christianity. Because you've got false prophets and false teachers that manipulate the word of God for their own benefit. And they portray this some, somehow, somehow, so, so-called Christianity is no, no, nowhere near what Christ died for. Nowhere near for what he lived for. And then we get the naysayers that want to hold that up as Christianity. Let me tell you something. That ain't it. That ain't it at all. So don't even use that to attest to what God has done. Can't even use it. Wouldn't even wouldn't even come close to what Jesus died for or what Jesus lived for. Not at all. Hey, babe, yeah. you leaving? I do. I have a GI. Table. You want to come say hi to my group? They want to see you. Oh, wow. Okay, my wife's coming to say hi. I know you've wanted to see my beautiful wife. Oh, wow. I know you want her to teach. I'm going to sh show you my beautiful. Wait, 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 honey. Wait, oh, come sit. Me. Come sit on my lap. Come sit on my lap. That way you can get in the camera. This is my wife, everyone. That's Stephanie, Mariah, Meg, honey, all these people are here every morning. These are my friends. My, friends. Uh, Jeff, all these people. Look at it. Look, honey, they're just going crazy over you. <laughs> He's a good man. <laughs> <laughs> this is my wife. She's gonna, we're, we are gonna do something together. We're gonna do something together. Just give look at it, honey. They're giving you roses. <laughs> <laughs> She's got to go to a doctor's appointment. That's my wife. She's awesome. Honey, they are going crazy. <laughs>
She's got to go to a doctor's appointment, but I told her that you guys wanted us to do a class. And she's like, oh, honey. And so she, we are going to do something. Maybe when we fin when I finish 2 Corinthians, we'll do something uh, together and uh, figure it out. But that's my baby. 27 years we've been married. I love her to death. She's, she's incredible in every way. We've been working together for a very long time. Uh, so, amen. Sorry about my, my rant there, but I tell you, the, the, you know, I'm pretty cool when it comes to people rejecting uh, the truth or not believing in God or things of that nature. I, you know, but when false teachers are out there, I get offended. Um, you know, when you look at Jesus, Jesus gets very hard line with false teachers. And I'm, I, I tell you, false teachers, they ruin lives. They ruin families. They ruin even the possibility of folks finding faith. And that stuff, man, we have got to be willing to speak out against false teaching because it ruins people, you know? And, uh, and that's why I'm here because I want us to be grounded where in the word of God, that is the goal to be grounded in the word of God. The word of God is where we need to be grounded. And that, and that speaks the truth to all things. It, it, it reveals, uh, God's truth and it exposes lies that are out there. And, and when it exposes it, we, we've got to be surrendered to it. Um, you know, God has been moving throughout the ages, and, and, and we have to be individuals that are grounded in the Word of God. We can't be institutional individuals. Our loyalty can't be to an institution. Our loyalty is to the Word of God. That's where our loyalty is, and the chips will fall where they fall. Amen? So listen, I do this every morning, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We work through a chapter in the Bible. I answer questions that may come up. We do it every morning. Once in a while, I get uh, derailed. Like yesterday, I wasn't able to do it because we were traveling. But I also post these um, up on YouTube. At Chip Mitchell 23 is my YouTube page. At You have to put the at sign before it. Chip Mitchell 23, you go there. Later on today, this particular chapter will be uploaded onto YouTube. In addition to that, uh, in addition to that, we have uh, I have a uh, web page which is groundedinhispromises.com. Groundedinhispromises.com. You go there. Um, I have a, a host of book recommendations, things that I've studied, reference books. I have uh, other videos that are up there. Just a great resource. You can put your email in there for when I start putting out uh, different um, newsletters and things like that. Um, you can get more studies. Um, just trying to build some momentum in putting the truth out there. What do I? What's my goal? My goal is that you will learn whatever you learn here, whether small or large segments, and then go share them with other people, whether it be just your family whether it be folks in your neighborhood or whether it be maybe just your coworkers, I, I, whatever you're learning, whatever nuggets you get, I just say turn around and share that with someone else. Why? Because there's so much uh, hostility in the world that we live in. There's so much false teaching that is out there. There's so much uh, anti-Jesus type things that are out there in the Bible that I want to help turn the tide. I want to put a positive message out there about God's word. I want the truth of God's word to be taught out there publicly so that folks can see it. So folks can see it and learn from it and make their own decisions about God. So how do you do that? Well, you follow. Go ahead and follow. If you like it, you like yourself as a black man. I have no idea what that question is. <laughs> Do you like yourself as a black man? I have no idea what that question is. Uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know what that means, uh, Black Rose. I have no idea. You mean, do I just like myself? I, I, I don't know what that means. God's word created both good and bad. For Brown. Do you like us as black people? What? I, I have no idea what you're asking. Um, I really don't know. Um, I know this. God calls me to love everybody. So I, I'm not sure. Oh, God is black. Well, Jesus gives us a description of God in John chapter 4. And you know what he says? 
God is spirit. Whoa, look at that orange. <laughs> that's that's what uh, the Bible says, um, that God is spirit. Do I love everybody? Which love? There's a few, I think there's four different loves in the Bible. There's there's a love of friendship. There's a love, an erotic love. There is a love that's a verb. It's an action. And then there's a, so there's three loves. Um, which one? It, the, the verb is to, that's the one that uh, God calls us to love everyone, to, to do. It's an action. It's not an emotional thing. It's not a feeling. It's not a love, like an erotic. It's a, it's a I will do. I will lay down my life for you. darkness and the color of black was created. Don't know what that means. Yeah, God is God is spirit. That's what we know. He manifests himself in many different ways. You know, that, that's that's what I know to be true in the scriptures. I think someone asked, do I celebrate Christmas? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians is a great um, text that talks about you know, eating food sacrificed to idols. That was an issue because they were like, this food is a representation of a pagan God, a false God. How can you eat it? And Paul makes it very clear that that stuff doesn't mean a hill of beans. Yeah, I mean, he he says it. So you can eat stuff that is representative of an uh, an idol. And he says it, it means absolutely nothing. Um, so um, I... I don't know what you're talking about. Do I believe in white supremacy? What, what, like, how do you believe in something like that? Like, what do you, <laughs> Black Rose, I'm sorry, man. I don't, I don't get your questions, man. I'm really sorry. Uh, I'm really sorry. Um, I just don't get your questions. Um, all I know and what I, pro oh, I let my dog out. All I know and what I proclaim is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is that is what I that's what I'm about, man. I'm not about any kind of social justice or political stuff. Uh, oh, the one on remarriage. Um, just go to um, First Corinthians. What is it? Seven, six, and seven. If you go to my YouTube, I talk about that. Uh, but I need I eventually do a thing on. I should do something on marriage and remarriage, but I've done that. Um, anything is also self against the knowledge of God. Yep, it's very true. Yeah, I'm all about the message. I, I, I'm not into politics. I, I'm not saying that, um, you know, people that are politicians or desire to be a politician is anything wrong. I'm just saying I'm not about that. I, that, that has its place, and I leave that for what it is. But what I try and uh, do is focus on spreading the message of Jesus Christ through his word. Uh, I, you know, where, let me, hold on. I'll look it up for you. Uh, where was it? Uh, uh, I did a segment on, um, uh, what was it? Uh, I think it was first Corinthians. Was it 13? Because uh, they asked him about marriage, right? Uh, let's see. Was it 13? Maybe it was 12. No. Because he, he did a series of questions, right, that they were asking. Uh, let me see. Sorry about that. Let me just looking it up. I just can't remember offhand. Yeah, it's First Corinthians chapter seven. So if you go to my YouTube page at Chip Mitchell twenty three. And look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that segment, we, we jump into marriage and remarriage. Um, you know, that, that's where I did it at. 
I'm sure I missed some questions while I was doing that. But if you go to at Chip Mitchell 23, thank you, Seabreeze, for putting that up. And you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we dive into marriage and divorce or, and remarriage right in there. So go check that one out. Um, that's a that's a great one. Now, I will say this, that, that debate of marriage and remarriage is, is one that's been around for for ages, even during the time of Jesus. There were issues with it, and uh, and there'll still be issues with it. Um, that's that's what we see. But uh, you know, again, what I'm I, I, I'm trying to teach the word. I'm trying to give people um, a great, a healthy understanding of God's word, so that they see it, understand it, and they can make decisions about their life through faith. That, that's what I'm about. Um, well, hey guys, it's been great. Tomorrow morning, uh, I'll be back, Lord willing, and we'll do Second Corinthians chapter five. Man, we are working through it. Uh, later on today, uh, this one, Second Corinthians chapter four, will be uploaded uh, to YouTube. I'll do that uh, again. If you're not following, I I ask you go ahead and follow. Please follow. Click the follow. Uh, that encourages me. Uh, helps me along in this journey. Uh, I appreciate so much all of the individuals that have faithfully uh, come here, uh, building this community that we have. Uh, please go to uh, my profile page. I put out stuff almost daily, uh, short inspirational things, sometimes on apologetics, sometimes on uh, a certain passage in the Bible. Once in a while, I'll come on late at night if I'm free. Uh, so, uh, these are things that I'm doing, uh, and I really, really enjoy it. Uh, but go to my website, grounded in his promises.com or, uh, the YouTube page. Oh, Heather, thanks for being with us. You're always a great supporter, Jeff. Uh, you know, it's always great to have you guys. I so appreciate your support. Uh, it is very encouraging. Thanks, Meg. Yes. Likewise, Meg. I want you to have an amazing day too. And pray for the innocent lives in war. Yes. So let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We do pray for the war that's going on overseas. Father, so many people are, are put in, in very challenging situations right now. The kids, the families, the confusion, the death, the loss, the emptiness, the hopelessness. God, we pray for this to end. We pray for some peace somehow, some way that can take place. But God, we pray for those that are suffering. Please get them out of that situation. But more importantly, Father, we pray for those that don't know you, that they may find you in this desperate hour, God. Lord, you're amazing. Thank you for your word. Your word is powerful, transformative, changing our lives. We thank you for all that we get in Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks so much for joining. Uh, Lord willing, we will be back here tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., uh, looking forward to seeing. We're going to jump on into uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tomorrow, and uh, hopefully we'll have another great one. Uh, great to see all of you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for all the likes. Thank you for the shares. Thank you for the roses. So appreciate it, Brenna. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate the support that uh, everyone has given. It gets me up. It inspires me in the morning. Uh, we've been doing this for months now. Jeff, thanks for the heart. I mean, we, we've we been doing this. I think we're close to 100 days, uh, which is just crazy. <laughs> I mean, wow. We've missed a couple of days in there. But, boy, it is just, it, it's amazing uh, how long we've been doing this. It's uh, since July, at least. I, I think, yeah, yeah, definitely since July. Because uh, we were in this. So that's, 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 woo. That's pretty awesome. Well, guys, have a blessed day. Uh, take care. <clears throat>